let's talk about the crazy long shots in science. Why they're not so crazy. Why they're actually very important. You see, we have to pursue many such ideas like this, being scientists. Many of those in order to just understand the world around us to begin with. And then from that, we can start to develop new technologies. And from there, the new jobs of the future. That's why we nutty professors do this kind of stuff. Okay? That's why it's so important to us. Well, I'm a microbiologist, so I'm well aware of a lot of these crazy ideas in my own field. For example, we're all aware of how microbes can make us sick, right? They can also make us well. And they can make lots of other things, like my beer I brought out here, for example. We can get those little tiny things to make lots of things for us, lots of stuff. Beer, cheeses, wine. We can also get them to produce antibiotics and other drugs. Energy. We can get them to do all those things. And at one time, each and every of those types of things were a long shot. Okay? Every one of them. But when we do this, we have to feed the microbes to get them to make something. There's no free lunch. They have to have be fed. For example, with my beer here, the yeast had to have sugars. That's great. Those sugars are pretty expensive. As a matter of fact, related to this, all of you put gasoline in your cars, the ethanol in there is being made very similarly from sugars. Very expensive way to do this. Think about it. You have to have all the land, all the water, all the fertilizer, time, energy. That's an expensive way to go have microbes make things. Okay, well, let's go back to a crazy idea, or let's come up with one that could be different. Let's find something that could be a cheaper way, more plentiful way, to have microbes make things. Let's feed them electricity and carbon dioxide to get them to make something. All right, crazy enough to begin with? Crazier still, I want to go on with this and have that replace fossil fuels. Wonderful fossil fuels that we all stand upon in our economy. Those are very wonderful, but they're still finite, and there's a growing environmental cost with them. So, can we come up with a different way to make things with microbes? Carbon dioxide and electricity. Well, you might say, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> I have to pay my electric bill. This is expensive. Well, the cost of electricity is coming down, particularly with renewables. And if you think about this for a minute, say a windmill blowing in the middle of the night that nobody can use, or a solar panel in the middle of the day when there's excess power, and these things are happening right now, those are pretty cheap electrons. That's pretty cheap electricity that you could possibly use. Then on the other side of this, if the electricity is your energy for these microbes to make stuff, they have to have carbon, the carbon dioxide is your carbon. Well, the carbon dioxide may not be free, but it can be pretty cheap as well. Matter of fact, it might be free at certain times because it's pretty much a waste. So we could have two food sources here that could be very inexpensive to get this idea to go forward, make chemicals and fuels from electricity and CO2. Now, where do such ideas come from? Where do we start with such crazy things of let's feed electricity and CO2 to microbes? Well, in a laboratory, of course. And there's several laboratories around the world that are pursuing this kind of idea, including my own. If you look over my shoulder here, you'll see a bunch of chaotic tubes and wires going into reactors that were feeding electricity and CO2 to microorganisms. So you surround yourself with a lot of smart people and you start to chase these kinds of ideas. Yes. That's the way we do that. But if you really think about it, ideas get started with something sooner than that. There's a seed of an idea that gets started. And this happens with all of you. I don't care what you do. It could be in business, it could be in music, it could be in science, it could be whatever. Somewhere in there, in a more common place, you come up with this kind of idea or a seed of an idea. And it's no different with me. Very common place when I think back of what got me started onto this. This is my first chemistry lab. This is my dad's gas station. This was my first chemistry lab. 
in a town called Cherubusco in northern Indiana, a little two-stoplight town to give a sense of how small and how common this place was, a little two-stoplight town, the second light we used for Christmas decorations more than anything else. If you went to the south end of town, it's my dad's station, and in there, hanging out in the 60s, I got to see how chemicals and fuels were being used, the dangers with them, and the benefits with them. But my dad, and this is the thing that really stuck, over and over and over again, he would tell me, think about this, Hal. Think about this. What if all of this went away? All those chemicals and fuels would go away. Think of the chaos then. That stuck with me. As I went on to become a scientist and a microbiologist and work on all the different things that microbes can do, I kept thinking about what you could make with them. And could you do something that you could get back to this problem of what my dad was worried about, those chemicals and fuels going away. Okay, back to the crazy electricity plus CO2. Can you feed bacteria to do this? Well, where do you find such microbes that could actually do this? Well, we've been doing a lot of bioprospecting, looking around lots of places in the world that we can find samples. But you know what? Local brewery is what worked the best. Back to my beer here again. A local brewery is where we could find what would really work. Not the yeast that make the yummy stuff. No, this is going out back. I wanted the smelly stuff, the stinky stuff that comes out after everything's done. You see, you have to wash the tanks out and all the good leftover natural chemicals go washing out back into a cistern and the bacteria back there turn it all into CO2 that bubbles on out. Now, what if you could take electricity, add that as energy, push that CO2 reaction back the other direction, get the bacteria to run in the other direction, and make valuable fuels and chemicals. So that's what we tried. But how do you get them? Well, we used an electrode. You dip your electrode down into this mess, and you can pull the organisms out because the ones that can do this, they're attracted to that energy source. They're attracted to that electrode just like flies to a light and you can pull them right on out. And now what we've done is we've managed to pull out those microorganisms and produce different chemicals like hydrogen and methane and formic acid and acetic acid and others. And guess what? We ordinarily make those chemicals from fossil fuels. They are valuable commodity chemicals. So we've gone from science fiction to science fact. And the research of where that's at right now is what else can we make? Because bacteria are capable of millions of other reactions. They can produce many more things. So the research is to link this further to make more things. In addition to that, the research is at the point of, well, how fast can we get this to go? You know, we don't want to wait for the dinosaurs to make our fuels and chemicals again. Well, to give you an idea of where we're at right now, if we were to build a reactor the size of a washing machine, put our bacteria in it, hook that up to a windmill or a solar panel or the tides, you can capture the energy equivalent of a gallon of gasoline in one day with that washing machine reactor. Think about that for a minute. One day, the equivalent of a gallon of gasoline of energy from that electricity using these microbes. And if we can keep working on it, perhaps we can make other chemicals, maybe the gasoline itself. So now we've reached the point where this is potentially the ultimate recycling machine. If we consume whatever we're using, that turns into CO2, we can feed it back to the microbes in such a reactor and start to make different chemicals. Now when we make my beer, I don't think so. I think we'll stick with the old-fashioned way to do that. But those chemicals and fuels that my dad was so concerned about losing, I think so. I think we could do this. Now, it's going to take a lot of time and effort and commitment by many of us, many more scientists, engineers, business people, perhaps some of you might join us and help us in that next breakthrough. But I'm not really asking that you become a geeky scientist 
and play around with smelly stuff. But I do ask that you pay attention to what's going on in science today. What's going on in science in the future? The value of pure scientific research, especially when it comes around to the long, crazy, long shots. And then find a way to open up your hearts and your minds to supporting such research. Cheers.